Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started since this is a live event. Um, I'm going to do a few introductions and things and then we'll get started with our discussion. So we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We have a great program set up for you. We hope that you, your family, friends and colleagues are all safe and healthy. We know that reopening has begun with COVID-19 and everybody's ready and excited to be <laughs> venturing out. However, we are all still working from home here. So if you hear any noises, if you hear anything strange, you know, we apologize for any background. Our, our friend Liam is in New York City. You might hear some city sounds in the background. Our friend Matthew's down in Richmond and Josh and I are in Alexandria, Virginia. So we hope that the background noise doesn't bother anyone. We are still working remotely. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We will open up to questions at the end. We're doing questions through the Q&A and the chat box, but you are more than welcome to ask your questions throughout. I will be monitoring them and I may interject with our speakers and say, hey guys, we have a great question coming from our audience. So feel free to put them in the chat or the q and I'll be watching both of those boxes. User First would also like to thank our partners at the Viscardi Center who are providing us with closed captioning services today. The Viscardi Center also provides digital document accessibility services. So if your organization is interested in that, just let us know and we can connect you also with our partners. That way we work with them on all digital accessibility, website accessibility documents, things like that. Today, our panelists are gonna share some of their personal experiences working with the disability community amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me introduce you to who our panelists are today. We have Liam Elkind. He is the co-founder of, of Invisible Hands Deliver in New York City. And you may have seen Liam on Fox News. You may have seen him on GMA. Um, they got started real quick with trying to just do a great service for um, people in vulnerable populations in New York City to make sure they get food and medication. But he's going to go into that a little bit more later. But that's Liam Elkind from New York City. We also have Matthew Shapiro. He is founder and CEO of Six Wheels Consulting. Matthew consults organizations and businesses on disability inclusion. He's also a, um, an advocate for the disability community. He lobbies in the state legislatures and on Capitol Hill. So he is a big voice um, and he likes to talk and you'll hear him talk in just a few. You also have my colleague, Josh Lochner. Josh is a digital accessibility specialist as well as one of our um, account executives. And he's gonna go into more with how he works with our clients and customers and things in just a bit. <clears throat> the access, we're gonna talk about today the accessibility community and the inaccessibility of essential goods, services, and information. We're going to talk about how, um, how to adhere to the health guidelines, whether you're working with the disability community or among them, some of the hurdles they have working within those health guidelines for COVID-19. Um, we're going to talk about how the digital accessibility can and has helped people with disabilities how businesses and government services, what's worked and what needs to be improved to help people with disabilities. And we'll take a look at what reopening means for people with disabilities. So we will of course um, also go where the conversation takes us. This is live. Um, so we won't be sticking to a script, which should make things very interesting. You may also hear about the 30th anniversary of the ADA. You may hear about some discussion on disability inclusion in the workplace as well as public arenas. So and then at the end, we're going to wrap up with questions from the audience. But again, feel free to ask throughout. So now I'm going to turn things over to our discussion moderator and my colleague, Josh Lochner. Hi, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to meet you all. Thank you for attending. Um, you know, we're really excited. I think we're going to have a really informative uh, conversation with some great young people that are really doing a lot to, to help. Um, with the COVID situation and helping persons with disabilities. Um, for, you, for those of you who are not familiar with User First, so we've actually been doing accessibility since 2012. Um, and we have a variety of solutions that can help organizations provide accessibility, um, you know, follow the WCAG guidelines, become ADA compliant, um, whether you know, you're just starting out and don't know what to do, or if you have a really mature um, accessibility practice and are looking to integrate it better into your development life cycles. Um, so with that, I personally, I work with our 
uh, retail customers uh, for the most part and our, our enterprise clients and helping them along their accessibility journeys. Um, but let's start off in learning a little bit about our panelists. You know, these guys have some great stories about, you know, how they, how they got to where they are and what they've been doing. So, um, Liam, let, let's start with you. The Invisible Hand story is just absolutely uh, a kind of a, a whirlwind, amazing one. Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, thank you for having me. I mean, this is an incredibly important conversation to be having, um, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, Invisible Hands was kind of a bit of an accidental nonprofit that began um, a couple months ago. I was witnessing, you know, the real inaccessibility of standard goods and supplies for people, food, water, um, toiletries, medicine, um, for people who had to be staying inside, particularly, you know, the elderly, the immunocompromised, the sick, the disabled, um, people who really shouldn't be leaving the house during this pandemic. And so I was feeling like, you know, I've got all this time on my frequently washed hands and there's got to be something more that I can be doing to help. And so that was when I saw a post on Facebook of a friend of mine um, who said, you know, has anybody heard of a volunteer service that I could volunteer for that would connect young, healthy people with people who are homebound right now? And everyone was saying, I would love to, to be part of that, but I don't know what exactly that organization is. Um, so I just reached out and said, you know, what if we made this service? It was a bit of childish naivete on our part, I guess. But, um, you know, we built a website, we passed around a couple flyers, and within three days, we had 2,700 volunteers. Um, we're now up over 10,000 or 12,000, I don't even know at this point. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's grown incredibly quickly, but I think that it's a real, um, it, it's a real testament to the humanity of people and how at a time when the world is pulling us apart, we're able to pull together and that by pulling together, we pull through. Um, and that's been one of the biggest lessons that I've taken from this. But, you know, as this pandemic has continued, you know, we're seeing people, particularly people with disabilities, um, having, having real difficulty getting access to important goods. Um, and especially, there's a huge intersectionality with poverty here. And that's going to last way after COVID is gone. And I think that we need to continually remind ourselves that it's not just about what this disease is, but it's about the, imp the implications that this disease will pose far into the future. And we need to be keeping disabled people or people living with disabilities front of mind at all times. You know, people living with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty as their non-disabled peers. You know, um, there's only 63 cents for every dollar that a non-disabled person makes. And so when we're dealing with the e huge economic fallout of this disease, we need to continually be reminding ourselves of the implications that it poses for people who aren't always at the front of the headlines, um, but who are, who are living and who are advocating for these people every day. Fantastic. No, great work. And we really appreciate what you're doing. And that's just crazy. You know, it just shows get out there and, and, you know, make something happen. You know, you don't have to wait for someone else to do it. Um, Matt, so let's talk a little bit about you, right? So, I mean, you're a big lobbyist, you know, develop, had your own consulting service. You're, you're doing a lot of great things. So tell us a little bit about, you know, yourself and, and how Six Wheels Consulting came to be. Yeah, sure. First of all, I'm, I'm super excited to be here and grateful for User First for putting on uh, this great conversation. And I just want to uh, echo what Liam was saying a second ago, because I am one of those people that he, he was mentioning. Uh, so, so not only do I uh, do advocacy work and have started my own consulting business, but I am a person with a disability. Uh, I was born with cerebral palsy and I uh, was born 12 weeks premature and my I was so tiny that my dad's wedding wrist or wedding ring excuse me fit on my wrist like it was a bracelet so I was I was rocking some some bling at a really early <laughs> early age but um so so I've always sort of been in this disability space and uh I, I one night in 2014 I was I knew I, I'd always wanted to work in this space and and be a part of the space always had a voice uh in this space and and one night in 2014 I was sort of just laying in bed and had, was having trouble finding work and, and had interviewed in a bunch of places and wasn't having uh, a ton of success. And then it sort of dawned on me to take uh, all of my years of doing youth advocacy work with other young people uh, and public speaking and, and just disability policy work uh, and try and turn that into a consulting business. So that's where uh, Six Wheels was born. And for, for me and for the work that we do, uh, we are really trying to challenge sort of the status quo uh, as it relates to disability. Um, something can be ADA compliant, but still not be fully inclusive and user friendly to um, people's needs, whether it be digital accessibility or physical accessibility, or even just the thought of inclusion. 
uh, in, in our societal space. There are many instances, even still today, where I will be out and about in public and people will come up to me and go, I'm glad you're out today. As if I am supposed to like not be and just be hanging out at home. Um, right now I am. I haven't, I haven't left my house that often. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I do that in three main ways through public speaking, consulting work. So I'll do assessments of spaces. I'll do resource development. I will help businesses create um, diversity plans around disability, things like that. And then I also, as Reagan said, am a lobbyist in the Virginia General Assembly working on policy issues around uh, the disability community. So uh, just love the work that I do. I've gotten to meet amazing people and, and go amazing places. And I'm just really happy to be here this afternoon for this important conversation. No, thank you. And, and thank you for all the work that you're doing and, and being a voice for people in the disabled community. That's absolutely fantastic and something that's, that's very much needed um, in Appreciate these days. That. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, COVID, right? And, and, you know, that's the main topic. And, you know, a lot of people think it's, you know, uh, you know, restaurants are opening up and I can get my hair cut. So, you know, it seems kind of like it's over, right? You know, for, for some people. Uh, I get that feeling, but it, you know, I have a feeling it's going to be around for a lot longer. Um, so Liam, let's, let's start with you and maybe you can share a little bit about what it's been like and what you've kind of, you know, seen in helping uh, vulnerable populations with, you know, the services that you do and, and, you know, what you've kind of seen being that, you know, front line in, in providing help to those in need. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of people who, who can't be going outside right now or, or shouldn't be just for fear of this disease. And, and, and rightfully so, you know, I think you're right. A lot of people think, oh, well, it, we're bored of that. Now let's move on with our lives. Um, but this disease is still here, right? We're not, some people are saying we're gonna hit a second wave. Some people are saying we never left the first. And in a lot of states um, across the country, the, the cases are just continue to spike. And so again, right, these populations that are staying at home are, are the most vulnerable right now. And they're having difficulty surviving both due to lack of food and lack of social connection. I think that the social connection is something that we often uh, don't, don't think about enough, that there's almost this, it's been described to me as a deeper hunger, that it goes beyond just food, but people were, were told to socially distance and to isolate. Um, but one thing that's nice about Invisible Hands and the work that we're able to provide is, is that social connection that my co-founder often describes it as, we're not socially distancing, we're physically distancing, but we can still socially engage with one another. And I think that for a lot of people who are living at home right now, you know, perhaps they have a social worker who usually comes by, is no longer coming by. And so having someone just on the other side of the door talking to them, you know, sharing about their life, learning about your life, that's, that's an incredibly valuable experience for people right now. Um, but you're right. There's a lot of hunger right now. There's a lot of thirst uh, for, for clean and affordable drinking water. Um, people may not have access to cooking materials. Um, it's, there, there's a lot of diverse needs right now in our community throughout New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, where we serve, and, and throughout the country. And so I think, again, it's, we, we just have to be keeping these people front of mind, constantly asking ourselves, how can we improve our services to be more accessible to them? So when we started this and we're trying to reach those people, you know, we were thinking, okay, you know, let's, let's get the word out there. Let's put up flyers and stuff like that. But flyers aren't reaching a lot of these people at home. And even if people hear about your service, if they can't use your website, your service is moot to them. It doesn't matter that you can deliver to them if they can't use your service. And so, you know, that's, I, I think we'll probably talk about this more, but that's where user first really came in handy that you guys were, were right there with us alongside us saying, let's help you make your website accessible to the people who are most in need right now that you're trying to reach. And so by, by doing that, you've helped us expand our reach to, to people who otherwise would not have been able to use our service and therefore wouldn't have been able to get these crucial materials to their homes. No, that's fantastic. And you bring up a great point, right? It, it's social distancing, not social isolation. Um, which is, you know, what, what some people, uh, you know, feels like they've been doing. So, you know, let's, let's go over to you, Matt, right? So as a person living with disabilities, like, you know, over the past couple of months, like, how, how has your life changed and in, in what, what has been the impact on you personally um, in trying to live through this experience? Yeah, as, as, as I've been joking with a lot of people, as, as I've been trying to engage with them, as the most extroverted extrovert, uh, I have had, had the, uh, the greatest struggle. Um, I, 
I, I touched on this in my introduction a little bit, but um, I've probably left my house 10 or less times. Uh, like, and when I say left my house, like gotten in my car and gone somewhere uh, 10 or less times in 15 weeks. Um, obviously, I have gone on walks and done things in my neighborhood, but it, it, has been, uh, it has been a struggle. I am very much a social being and like being around other people. Uh, but, and, I, and I will also say I started isolating before it was mandated to uh, because I really thought, uh, you know, what is the point of, of even risking it, right? Um, so, so I just made the decision uh, and my family made the decision to, you know, if we didn't really have to go anywhere, we, we weren't going to. And, uh, you know, it, 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 for, for people with disabilities, you know, uh, our community is, is scared right now to know, um, you know, and not, not being able to, to go to our, uh, our therapies or our, or our doctor's appointments and see the people that we need to see. Um, and, and that's been, uh, that's been different. And, and like Liam said, I, I don't think this is something that is, uh, you know, come January, this will be all gone, right? I think we're kind of in a new wave of life kind of thing. And we'll talk about that um, more as this conversation progresses. But I think that's where technology and, and organizations like User First and, and other things can really be uh, a way to truly, truly level the playing field for sure. Oh, fantastic. And yeah, that's, you know, thanks for sharing. I mean, it's great to get someone like yourself, your, your perspective and kind of continuing on that, you know, you mentioned, you know, not being able to get the, you know, the, the, the therapies and stuff like that, that you're used to. So when we think about like health guidelines, right. And, and, you know, for, for yourself and also the people that you advocate for, um, you know, what, how, you know, how are you guys receiving that? What are some kind of the challenges, you know, we're being told to wear a mask and things like this. So how, you know, let's start with you and talk a little bit about how these health guidelines have, you know, had an impact. Yeah, health. there's, there's a, that's a great question. There's a lot of instances, particularly for our community, uh, using the mask example, if you are somebody who is on the autism spectrum, you may not like the sensory feeling of a mask and it may uh, it, it may cause you to to feel agitated and and to get into a situation where you might have a meltdown so you're probably not leaving your house if you are a person who is blind or visually impaired uh, you know I, I would love to see more of an uptick in the masks that have the clear um, uh, cutout so that people who are blind or visually impaired or, or deaf even can read lips and see um, uh, you know, what people are trying to communicate, whether it be a doctor or somebody else. Um, other ways in which it's, it's being affected is somebody who has to have direct support um, services come into the home. Uh, like if somebody needs to have a personal care attendant, help them get up in the morning, uh, help provide meals, help provide dressing, all of those things. I have heard many stories and seen a major downtick in people providing those services specifically because they don't want people coming into their homes. So that is putting additional strain on families to provide those services when typically they're you know, relying on those personal care attendants and other services um, that just aren't happening. So uh, you know, those families might be feeling the strain and just, just not being able to kind of get a break uh, in, in this scenario. And that is certainly tough for a lot of folks. So it's, it's, it's affecting the disability community in a number of ways. Um, and, and regardless of what your disability is, you're, you're feeling the strain of it in some way, shape, fashion, or form. No, that's, that's a really good perspective. You know, you didn't, don't really think about um, assistive care and, and things like that. And so that's, that's a very important point. Um, over to you, Liam. So, you know, as far as your organization, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, as COVID evolved, right? So, you know, how you guys were, you and your volunteers were, um, keeping yourselves safe during, you know, COVID and also, you know, how has that process kind of evolved um, and, you know, what you guys are currently doing now? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Matthew, you know, thank you for doing this work to raise this awareness. But I think, you know, we all should be aware this is not Matthew's crux to bear. This is on all of us. And it's not Amen. a personal problem. It is a policy problem. You know, New York City, as this disease was spreading, when, thank you, when, when, when schools were shut down and moved online, you know, New York City said, 
yeah, it's okay to, to cut special education. That I, and I understand, you know, times are hard and funding is tight, but it's, I, I think it signals that a lot of policymakers view people with disabilities as expendable and, and view disability services as expendable. And that cannot continue. If we are trying to build an inclusive society more broadly, we can't just leave it to people with disabilities to fix the system for themselves. Mm -hmm. we, we, we need to be creating a more inclusive space for all of us. Um, and, and so thank you for, for being a leader in that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And if I can add to that too, because, uh, you know, even, and I think that that education piece for particularly for students on SPED um, or who receive special education services, that's been a, a major struggle. I know that's something we've been struggling with here in Virginia and I've had conversations with uh, many organizations who were providing those services and then for whatever reason they lost that funding during this time uh, and were, were, it, it are not able to any longer provide that. And so um, you are putting your SPED students back further because they're not, you know, in Virginia, we've been out of school for three, four months now, um, even before summer even started. So you're seeing students losing educational time uh, and particularly you're seeing your SPED students uh, be affected even worse. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, I have a question that's popped up and I think um, Matthew might be the best one to answer this. Um, I can chime in a little bit. I will certainly try. <laughs> Our friend Robert has asked us, can you comment on telehealth approaches that have come about but without a recognition of the importance of training. So um, I can start commenting and then maybe Matthew can, can um, finish up because telehealth sure. from the experience that we've seen at User First, obviously there's a lot of people trying to do um, online um, doctor's visits, make appointments, find where they're going. And a lot of the um, telehealth websites really are not accessible for uh, many of the same reasons that private businesses aren't. They just weren't created with that in mind. Sure. And so we're trying to um, uh, make um, telehealth services aware of accessibility and help them out. And Matthew, do you want to share some of your personal experiences with yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think there are certain instances where certain aspects of telehealth are great in the sense that like I, I, am, I, go, to, I go to therapy just to have mental clarity and, and uh, you know, just clear my head every so often. And so Telehealth in that scenario would be perfect because there's really, you're just talking to someone, right? And you're, you're conversing in that way. Uh, ironically enough, uh, from, a, from a family standpoint, my brother and my sister-in-law just had their, we just had our niece, and, or I just had my niece. And so uh, they had to go through the whole pregnancy basically on the back end doing telehealth. And so, um, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to, deal with the baby and, and go through all the OBGYN appointments and telehealth is, you know, you check your vitals and you do all that, but that's about it. So like in certain scenarios, telehealth is great. Um, I, I think for people with disabilities, telehealth is great, but if you have to have some kind of physical examination or they need to dive deeper, you can't really get that um, just over a conversation. That's where somebody needs to examine you uh, and, and, and kind of, get to the bottom of what may be bothering you. So um, there's some, definitely some positive aspects, aspects to telehealth, but there's certainly some challenges that arise as well. One, one thing I would add to that, so when, when we're talking about telehealth, it, it's remotely, right? You're seeing a lot of uh, phone applications being used for this. So you know, it's great that you can provide these services via you know, the internet and via mobile devices. However, you know, if, if you're not actually testing those applications for accessibility, if, if you're, you know, not going and making sure that they work with the voiceover screen reader on iPhone or the talkback screen reader on Android or work properly with swipe gestures for people that can't, um, you know, do all the tap motions and, and things like that. So, you know, that, that's also very important because if I can't use your application or if I can't use your telehealth website, then I'm not going to get access to this, those services as well. When I think about it from the standpoint of somebody who uses a screen reader, right? Like, and that's where the service that you, provo you all provide uh, is a huge aspect. But like if, if that person is in crisis because of a health matter um, and they can't even access to your point, Josh, like they can't even access that portion of the website, then that doesn't no good. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
that actually leads to a, a great kind of segue, uh, Liam. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, so you, you're focused on vulnerable, you know, serving vulnerable populations and, and helping people in need. Um, you know, it led you to, to, to a focus on accessibility. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, what, what led you to decide to focus on, you know, providing an accessible website and, and what you, you know, what you decided to do and, and how that process went. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, when we started this out, you know, and, and, and set out to just put a little bit of good into the world, um, you know, we were really trying to think about who are the people who most need our service. Um, and so obviously on the news, we're all saying, you know, the elderly are the people who have to be staying home. So, okay, great. The elderly people, um, obviously anyone with a disease shouldn't be leaving the home. If you're immunocompromised, of course, one critical piece that was left out of that conversation was people living with disabilities. And so, you know, I, and, and, and look, we, we are not at all a perfect organization. And one thing that we actually often see is, you know, a volunteer will deliver to a home and say, yeah, they, they didn't, like, it wasn't an old person. They didn't seem sick. Like, I don't, I don't know why I had to deliver to this person. Like, maybe they were just trying to, like, you know, scheme you guys to get a free delivery. And, and what we're saying is, no, you know, we're not, we're, we're not putting a barrier to who we're delivering to. If you check that you're homebound and you need a delivery, we will trust you because you're either going to over-include or under-include. And we want to make sure that we're over including because if you set barriers to access you you limit people who will need your service but can't meet those barriers and so you know we'll, we'll often remind people a lot of disabilities are invisible and so we need to be um cognizant of that and and welcoming of anyone who says that they need our service but but to your point um you know we, we were trying to figure out okay so we say we can deliver to people with disabilities how do we make that a reality and so we wanted to make sure that our website was as accessible as possible. And so, you know, a quick Google search, your, your SEO must be perfect because I think that y'all were like number one on there. Um, so, you know, it, it was one of those, you know, see how, how accessible my website is. And to us, our whole platform is accessibility, is making things more accessible. So if we're not living by that, how can we possibly claim that that's our mission? Um, so we, we reached out to you and you, you ran the check and said, it looks good, but here are some things we can do. And we can add this widget to your website, you know, that adds a screen reader that lets you navigate by keyboard, lets you put it in, in, in black and white, stuff like that, um, that, that has been really helpful. And uh, I mean, you can speak to the, to the numbers better, but you know, that has, I think, proved to be an invaluable resource to people who are trying to get our service or get access to services like this, but may not be able to, given the way that our system is working. And you know, when we started out, you, the only way you could place a request was by was was through our website, and and we quickly expanded that to be you know okay, call me over the phone, um, and it was my own personal phone number, and then you know Bernie Sanders emails out that phone number to his constituent list and says call this number if you need free food. Doesn't specify New York, so I'm getting calls from like all around the country, people saying, can you bring me free food? No, I can't. Please leave me alone. Stop calling me. <laughs> But um, it's so we also built a call center for people who may be visually impaired to be able to, to place a request that way, um, or for people who don't have internet access for any reason. Um, so it's, it's constantly a question of, you know, questioning ourselves, questioning how accessible we are and how we can make ourselves more accessible to populations that we're trying to reach. Yeah. No, and it was great. So you, you know, you, you would reach out to us and, and you and I had a conversation about improving accessibility and where the site was currently. Um, and at that time, you know, user first itself was looking for ways to, to help, um, you know, with this crisis and, you know, we're, we're not chefs, we're not doctors, you know, we, we're just, we're technology people. So, you know, but we knew that there was a big fit between what we do and what people like your, yourself, um, are doing in this space. So, you know, that's how we got hooked up and we made it as a decision that, you know, user first wanted to, um, you know, donate this software to invisible hands. And to date, um, we've seen over, and I think we, we started somewhere around March, like middle towards the end of March, but to date we've seen over 367,000 activations of our you remediate software um and you know and, and i just gotta say it was the easiest thing in the world like i was worried we were gonna have to do all this kind of like coding stuff like no we got on a zoom and it was like maybe half an hour and most of it was us goofing around you know like you yeah. guys you know it was you you put in the widget and it was it was there and it looked beautiful with the website i mean it was the easiest thing in the world and i'm, I'm just incredibly grateful for that yeah no not a problem and you know like like liam said you know you're not really a technical guy you basically installed our software and just so people know um, I'll, I'll show it now, 
But, you know, Liam installed our software and, you know, my team worked overnight as quick as possible. And, you know, I think within, you know, less than 24 hours, we had this site done. So if you see here in the upper left-hand corner, this is the you remediate um, uh, menu. And there are some accommodations that are done automated through the software, like, you know, changing the color contrast. Um, so you just get a quick refresh of the page. We don't, you know, modify the, the look in the, or the, you know, the way that the page functions at all. So the user experience remains the same, but, you know, we do some things to enhance the user experience. And then the real difficult ones, the ones that really make an accessibility impact are things like navigating my keyboard. So if I wanted to, I'll just hit apply here. Um, if I wanted to request a delivery and I'm someone with a motor disability that doesn't have the ability to use a mouse, I can quickly, by using the tab key, um, use the you remediate menu and the accommodations that we've provided. And also, you know, as I mentioned, we have real people going in, testing, making sure this stuff works, using screen readers to configure everything to ensure that it, it, it um, adheres to the WCAG guidelines because automation doesn't fix everything. Um, but here, as I tab in, you know, we can get through some easy skip links to get to certain specific parts of the pages. But now I can get, you can see here, we have this top part of the website and I can press enter to enter into this section. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go over to request a delivery, right? Now I can quickly get there. And the other thing to show um, really briefly is, so we're talking about, you know, keyboard navigation, which is also keyboard navigation, screen reader compatibility. These are the two things that people really file lawsuits over when it comes to accessibility. Um, so using a screen reader, you know, it's very important, you know, screen readers, um, you know, they look at images, they look at links, and it's not just what it, that it's a link, but what is the role of that link? So if we look at the top here, we just see like invisible hands. But if I turn on the screen reader accommodation, you know, our software is then adding in what the role is, right? So this link is to go to the visible hands homepage, which is very critical for someone using a screen reader to understand what's going on and what this link actually does. So I'll stop sharing my screen, but no, thank you. We're, we're really happy that we've been able to partner with you guys and, and you know, I mean, just seeing by the activations alone, um, and I think over 6,000 just so far this month, um, it's great to see that so many people are getting served. Um, I'm sorry, Reagan, yeah. do you have a question? Yep, we actually have um, a couple questions coming in online, so let's address this first one. Can someone comment on your experiences with ADA compliance efforts on commercial sites, successes, struggles? So Josh, that one will be for you to start first. So your successes, struggles with ADA compliance, and then there's a part two to this that I'll address to Matthew in just a second. Okay, um, successes and struggles. I think, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a couple of things I'm hearing out, you know, that are being kind of told by lawyers. Um, well, first off, I'll say that a lot of people, there, there are some people, especially in the UX user interface community and, and designers and things like that, that are very much advocates of accessibility um, and wanting to adopt those practices within their organization. However, businesses oftentimes don't recognize the ROI that, you know, the, the extra spending someone in the disability community um, can bring to their business, the brand loyalty when you are accessible. Um, so oftentimes businesses are reluctant to adopt accessibility until someone unfortunately files a lawsuit. Um, you know, that's definitely something we'd like to see companies be more proactive, especially in, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion, but, you know, oftentimes persons with disabilities are forgotten about. So, um, you know, successes are around, you know, helping people, at, at the end of the day, success is, you know, making sure that someone who wasn't able to use the site can use this, the, the site in the same way that an able-bodied person could, that someone who can see can. So they can go to the website, all the buttons are actionable, they can get through the checkout process. If you're doing that, that is a success. Um, a lot of the struggles that I've seen are companies often try to do it on their own without help from experts. 
Um, you know, the, the WCAG guidelines are there. They're just guidelines. They don't, you know, if you follow everything to a T, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're protected from a lawsuit. Um, so, and oftentimes people fall into, a lot of the struggles I see are around people falling into this idea that if I use a free plugin tool that just does a quick automated scan of my site, then I'm going to be protected. And, and that's not the case because I had mentioned previously, you really need an expert that can go through your site, the screen reader, that can go through keyboard navigation um, to tell, you know, to tell you what needs to be fixed, because those are the real issues that people are filing lawsuits over. Um, and whoever that was, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, set up a conversation and talk in more detail about the ADA, how it applies to commercial versus government and all of that. And Josh, if I, if, well, I was gonna, if I could add a little more context, Regan, if that's okay. Um, yeah. No, please do, but Matthew, the yes. same person, it's our friend Robert. And he is also asking, while you're going to address that, the okay. second part of his question is around, um, ironically, cities and local governments aren't accessible. And so I figured you working with the, you know, uh, the Virginia legislature, I'll be okay, words, words are good here. Um, <laughs> you working with many cities and we've had some experiences, you could also address that from a, a it's ironic that governments aren't as accessible as they should be. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Robert, thank you for, for both of those questions. If I may address the first part of your question um, and add a little bit more context to what Josh was saying, you know, there are 56 million Americans in this country who live with disabilities, right? So that's, that's nearly 20% of our overall population. And our world is not accessible. Even though we have the ADA in place, uh, I, I make the argument, I, and I think I said this in my introduction, Something can be ADA compliant, but still not be user friendly. And uh, also to Josh's point, you know, if, if we as a society did more to make sure that we were more inclusive and made sure that we set up our spaces so that wheelchair users could navigate more easily or um, employees had training on how to engage with somebody who is blind or visually impaired or uh, somebody on the autism spectrum, uh, that would help their bottom line, like Josh said. Um, people with disabilities and their families and, and everyone that surrounds them has about $220 billion in discretionary income to, to, to use in our communities. And so we as a society are missing out on the incredible untapped potential of the disability community, not only as, as, uh, as, as purchasers and buyers, but as people who could work in our spaces too and, uh, and, and, and gain jobs in our spaces. To your other question, um, government agencies, believe it or not, are some of the most inaccessible um, things out there. Um, I know I have engaged with many, many state agency websites in particular, um, and they're very much not accessible. Uh, one of the other things that always comes up too is if somebody is trying to apply for a job within like state government, oftentimes you have to do an online application in order to sort of start that process. And in many instances, that online application is not accessible to somebody who uses a screen reader. And this is not state specific. I've, I've seen this all over the country. Um, and so again, that's where a service like User First uh, could come in handy and really level the playing field to help those state agencies find incredible talent with, uh, of people with disabilities. Um, there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Yes, the ADA is 30 years old, uh, but I, I have always made the argument that, uh, and, and this is what I try to do within my work, is that we need to go above and beyond what's required by the ADA to make our society that much more inclusive. And I would also argue that we need to have another disability rights movement and sort of another ADA build on top of that, um, because a lot of the struggles that happened before the ADA are still in place and are still struggles today and we haven't seen a ton of progress on those fronts. Yeah, and so, um, and so I guess there was one other thing that uh, Reagan wanted me to mention, the impact of accessibility in SEO. Um, so for you know, non-technical people that might not be aware, so Google has changed their search algorithm and it places more weight on websites that are accessible. 
Um, so yes, improving accessibility also has the benefit of in, improving your, your SEO and page ranking within um, search engines like Google. Um, so honestly, we could spend a whole nother conversation around just accessibility, digital accessibility. I guess, what, was there another question? Reagan? Yeah, there's two things. And um, I'm going to address one question we got in the Q&A box real quick, and then okay. we'll have to take this one offline. Um, so uh, our question from Sarah is that Liam mentioned the inherent and systemic policy issues that were exacerbated during the pandemic including education. Inclusion in Virginia schools is something we're working on with one of our clients. As schools look at different potential hybrid models for the fall, including alternating in-person and online instruction, what are some thoughts or ideas on how school systems can proactively work towards more effective, inclusive access for students? And Sarah, I'm reading that out loud because I want you to know we actually are starting to work with the National School Boards Association and we're working on this issue. So what I'd like to do, Sarah, is I will follow up with you offline because these are not our education specific folks. <laughs> but I did want to address this question. It is very important, digital inclusion on everything, whether we're talking about essential goods and services, government services, healthcare, education. It is a major, major issue that COVID-19 has brought to light. So Sarah, I'm going to contact you offline about that. And then, um, there was a question around also um, specific sites for people who are disabled, for people in the disability community. Many are not um, compatible. They are also not um, totally accessible as what they might think. And I just want to address that real quick to Josh's point, is it takes consistent testing, test manual testing, automated testing. It takes constant remediation because of updates to your website. And so, and, and again, some people, when these websites were developed, it wasn't that, it wasn't intentional. It was, they didn't know how to develop them using screen readers. And that's what we're here for and here to um, help out. Um, Josh, we've had some other questions around cost um, for digital accessibility. Again, we'll probably take that offline. I can um, get Josh your information and, and he can have more of those conversations. Um, we are coming up on 145. Josh, what was the next topic you wanted to discuss real quick? Yeah, so we kind of have two quick ones to go through and then we're happy to open it up for, for general questions. But, you know, let, let's start with Liam. Um, you, know, I, you know, in your service, you know, what uh, in serving people and, and helping, you know, what's working, what's not, right? So what things are, are, are you guys doing that have had a lot of, you know, big impact and working really well? And then areas where you think there's, there's room for improvement and, you know, ways to go. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, so we're constantly improving. So what can we do better? A whole lot of things. Um, and I'll, I'll start with that. You know, uh, one thing that has been brought up to us is having, um, uh, like a face to face, uh, like FaceTime kind of interactions with clients. Um, who, who may be both, you know, who, who may be, um, you know, have, have auditory impairments, um, who may be deaf and not, able, and not able to use the website, and then calling us isn't an effective remedy either. Um, and so, but if, you know, if you could be on, on FaceTime with them and reading lips kind of thing, that that could be additionally accessible. Um, a lot of homes are also not accessible or not easy to reach. Um, so that makes it tough when we're trying to make deliveries. Um, and, you know, and that also hampers volunteers' ability that if, you know, like, homes to a lot of people are not accessible you know so if, if you're trying to volunteer but you're in a wheelchair and there's no ramp it, it really you you can't and so it's not just a, a problem of you know let us help the disabled community like people with disabilities are stepping up and doing the work themselves and we need to be there to support them to be able to do that good work so it's it's not just a question of Oh, let us go in and help them. You know, it's it, it's such a paternalistic way of thinking, and so we're we're trying to figure out other ways to to be a more accessible community to our volunteers as well as to the people to whom we're delivering. Um, what's worked well? I mean, you know, I got to plug you. Um, the the widget has worked incredibly well. Um, you know, building out our call center, having you know warm, receptive, trained call uh, center volunteers has been incredibly effective, um, and and has helped us navigate that a lot. You know, we we get some calls from people who, uh, you know, may not be sick um, or, or elderly, but who may have agoraphobia. 
um, and, and don't leave the house for that reason. And so we deliver to them as well. So it's just constantly expanding our mindset, I think, of, of what does disability mean and, and, and refocusing the conversation towards maximal accessibility, regardless of individual circumstance. Um, and so anytime we get a call from someone and we realize, oh, we can't serve them for this reason, we have to interrogate why that is, what the systems are that we have in place that are preventing it from being accessible to that person, and then researching, putting in the work, researching how can we make it more accessible for those people. So again, you know, reaching out to you, building out a call center, those kinds of steps that we're taking um, are in the name of making ourselves as accessible as possible. But it is an ongoing conversation and no one is perfect. I mean, you know, not having accessibility on city websites is obviously a huge problem. I mean, it's like having the Center for Disabilities, you know, be a building and there's no ramp leading up to it or a wheelchair store without a ramp. I mean, it, it just makes no sense. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, it's something that is on all of us to be doing better on. Um, and, and it's okay to say, you know, we're not there yet. It's not a weakness to admit that you're not there yet because none of us are, but it is a thing. It, it is on you. It is a weakness if you see that problem and then don't take steps to mediate it. No, it's fantastic. A lot of people, you know, so I, I applaud you and your efforts. A lot of people um, just don't even, you know, they're, they're not aware, right? So at least you guys have the awareness that, hey, this is something you need to work on and that you're actively trying to do it. And, and you're right, it's not always going to be perfect. Um, but you do what you can and you try to get it to a point that you can help as many people and get it to a point where it's as close to as perfect as possible. Now, Matt, you know, kind of transitioning over to you and talking about, you know, what's working, what's not, you know, for someone with a disability in the disability community, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what things businesses can do to improve and, and, you know, what things you don't like and, where, you know, where, where can we make some changes that can help people like yourself? Yeah, so I, I, I view this opportunity as potentially like the dawning of a new like world overall for all of us. Um, but I, I, I can see, you know, one of the biggest challenges for the disability community is employment, right? And for people finding jobs and, and getting jobs and, and making a living. And so, and one of the arguments has always been, well, as a person with a disability, can I, can I work from home, right? And can I, uh, can I do all of that? And pre-COVID, the answer to that question has always been no, because I don't want to spend, me, business owner, I don't want to spend all these resources on giving, giving you the accommodations and the whatevers to, to um, set it up so that you can work from home. Now, that argument is really null and void and can no longer really be made. Um, we have seen everyone be, being work from home uh, or, or working from home, rather. And, and, I think you are going to see globally a trend of businesses sort of coming to the realization, oh man, I can save, you know, millions and millions of dollars by not having a storefront and or a building that my employees go into every day. Matter of fact, you've seen, uh, I think Twitter has done that. Google has done that. Some really big businesses uh, in Silicon Valley and, and other places are, are, are already transitioning to that. And I think you're going to see more businesses do that because it's going to save them money. But that in turn means I think more people with disabilities could potentially be, get hired um, and, and work from home and, and you know, make a living and, and do great work. Um, so so that, there is an opportunity there that I think we're going to all capitalize on because of this COVID experience. Um, what's, what's been some issues and some challenges? Uh, again, uh, everyone has sort of come to the realization now that I am a political nerd, so I've been following... Uh, some of these policy discussions, uh, you know, not only in the state of Virginia, but kind of federally too. And in a lot of these uh, stimulus packages that, that our government is putting forward, uh, in a lot of instances, people with disabilities are once again sort of being left behind uh, in those uh, conversations. And so I, I think we could do a much better job of making sure that we have the supports and services in place on a federal and state level uh, to to you know make sure that people with disabilities are getting this getting those services that they need because like we've stated many of them haven't been able to leave their house and get those services uh, that they desperately need so uh, I think we could do a much better job on that front and um, you know just have uh, you know have more compassion and and just make sure that everyone is taken care of for sure 
Great, thanks. I'm going to intercede here. I do have a question, and I think this is a great question for Josh. And Josh, overall, I want you to talk about um, the services user first provides because we're getting some of these questions in, in the chat room here. And one of them being, do we do ADA website audits? Um, I know we have, a, we have an offer to do a free risk assessment, which isn't as deep as our audits. So I thought, Josh, since we're getting questions, you might want to talk to some of the services that user first provides. Yeah, um, you know, if you do have specific questions, feel free to reach out to us after this uh, webinar. I'm happy to go into it, review your website um, specifically to see where some barriers might be. We do some free automated scans in, in to help uh, individuals understand where their websites are currently with compliance in, in providing accessibility. Um, but once again, those are not the same as kind of Reagan mentioned, the same as a full audit where someone goes through manually with a, um, you know, screen reader and keyboard navigation. We do provide those services as well. Um, I showed previously our, our Uber Mediate widget that can integrate with the website. Um, and my team does a lot of the, the, the heavy lifting to make it accessible in addition to the software itself. Uh, we also have automated testing platforms, more of an enterprise level. So these are better than just your little, you know, Chrome plugin or, or you know, website, enter domain and, and have it scan. Um, so it kind of goes beyond that and also a lot of features and functionalities for more enterprises looking to adopt that into their development life cycles. Um, we also do consulting, whether that's on the policy side. Um, you know, design, whatever have you. So ha reach out to us afterwards. Happy to go into that in, in, in a lot more detail. Um, I guess, do we have time to do kind of one more topic before Q&A, Reagan? Uh, you're on mute. So, okay. I, I I'm muted. That, it helps to unmute when you're live, folks. Um, <laughs> We actually only have a few more minutes because of the time we have our closed captioning service. Plus, we have enjoyed this conversation, and I hope that um, everybody uh, joins us another time. So if you guys want to do some wrap-up, actually closing comments, I think that would be a good time to do it right now. Yeah, I, you know, so guys, maybe you want to just talk a little bit about, you know, what the future, you know, kind of your, your closing thoughts, and, and where do you think we go from here with the COVID situation? Liam, you want to go first? If you insist. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we talk a lot about wanting to get back to normal. And I think that that's a totally reasonable thing. It's a scary time that we're in and we're all longing for the times when we could walk around without a mask on or without fear of getting stuck with a virus. Um, but I think that when we talk about what normal means, we have to remember that normal does not mean good. Um, and for a lot of people, normal is affirmatively bad. Um, and that people are not living in the kind of ways that they should be in, in the 21st century. Um, and that as we return to normal, we have to, and you know, knock on wood, we will, but we have to remember that there are people who have been unduly impacted by this virus and the ensuing economic fallout, and that it's on all of us to build a better world for those people and with those people. Um, and so part of that is, if that's delivering groceries and medicine to a neighbor of yours, awesome. If that's, you know, working... To, to make your business more accessible, amazing. Um, I think we just need to center the voices of people who have too often been left out of the conversation. Um, and so it's an honor to be here and to, to be able to speak about this issue. I'm not an expert on disabilities at all. Um, I'm just someone who wanted to, to do some good and, and found you all and you helped me so much with that. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to all of you and I'm, I'm really excited to see where we're all able to go as a community after this, as we return to a better normal. Fantastic, Matt. And and I and I would sort of echo those sentiments as well. Um, I I do appreciate uh, being part of this conversation. Uh, I am I am somewhat of an expert, having lived with disabilities for my entire life. Uh, obviously, I'm a, 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 it it evolves and changes every day, and I, I learn new things every day. But not only do I again do I think we're you know returning to normal, but I I do think it is somewhat of a new normal, right? And we are going to have to um, adjust in the ways that we do business, in the ways that we do social outings, um, and, and whatnot. And so I, I couldn't agree more with Liam to say that it, it is on all of us to, to work together to make sure uh, 
all groups, whether it be dis uh, people with disabilities or uh, people on the LGBTQ spectrum, all minorities are sort of taken care of. Uh, and, and we think about all of those things uh, in the decisions that we make. And, and, you know, I can't do it alone or Liam can't do it alone. It, it really does fall on all of our shoulders uh, to do that. So that's why I'm grateful to have been a part of this conversation. I'm grateful to uh, everyone who has provided amazing questions in the chat box. And, uh, you know, because, because it's going to take all, what, 30 of us or so that are on this call to, to, to move the ball forward. So, um, you know, let's, let's get to work and let's, let's see what kind of change we can make, I guess. Fantastic. And just, you know, my, my closing comment is to the, you know, individuals on this call, um, you know, obviously you care and that's great. Uh, evangelize within your own organizations, um, you know, bring it, bring it to the forefront and make sure that other people are aware, um, you know, as part of this kind of new normal, you know, the internet is going to be even more important as people, you know, more services move online. So challenge yourselves, take digital accessibility um, seriously, because, you know, the internet is a great equalizer. It allows, you know, everybody to get access to your information, your products, your services. So, you know, make sure that you're doing your part as well. I too would like to thank everybody that's all our attendees who attended today. You took your time to um, join our discussion. I want to thank Liam. I want to thank Matthew. Um, thank you, Josh, for being a, a wonderful host. Um, and, and some things that um, <laughs> this captioning broadcast stopped. Um, some things that you can try yourself is try tabbing through a website on your own. Um, you can download um, a, a screen reader called JAWS and you can try that yourself. Um, so those are some things you can do to try to simulate the experience of somebody who may not be able to access um, the website the same as we do. And, and if you think about people with, say, Parkinson's disease who may not have the um, functionality to control a mouse, or we even work with um, a veterans organization, veterans with PTSD are starting to use screen readers. It reduces their stress. So when we broaden our perspective on people with varied abilities and, and varied disabilities, when we start to think about it from different points of view, um, Matthew, wasn't there, do you have a, a saying about this? Uh, about, I, about the disability community, we can all- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I thought I brought that up before too, but I'm happy to do that now um, because it, as breaking the saying, it's really important because the disability community is the only community uh, that we could all uh, potentially join in the blink of an eye. Um, and it's all going to be a community that we all eventually join as we age uh, and get older. So we're going to need accommodations, um, you know, as we age. So, you know, why not do it now while you're able and capable um, to do that? So, you know, again, that's why I challenge all of you to, to go forward from today's call and make change. And I think that's a great wrap. So we're going to end with be sure to follow User First on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Also, Matthew Shapiro, you can follow him as well at Six Wheels Consulting. I encourage you to go and help Invisible Hands if you can, even if it's making a donation. Yep, shameless ploy because Liam didn't do it himself. Um, <laughs> so we like to help our partners as well. Anyway, thank you all for joining us today. This will be recorded and posted later for people to use. And we hope you all have a wonderful day.